welcome to Stories from the Pitch, a podcast dedicated to creating a living oral history about street performing and some of the crazy characters who populate this world. I'm Magic Brian, your host for this growing collection of interviews. In this very special episode, the human knot, Al Miller, talks to the 2021 inductee into the Busker Hall of Fame, the one and only Sharon Mahoney. Sharon is hilarious, direct, and has a big personality. And if you've never met her before, you get a taste of it at the very start of the interview. Sharon shares her journey as a performer, starting with an interest in improv in high school, pursuing a degree in theater arts, and getting to do workshops with the clown duo of Mump and Smoot. It was there she found her love of character, and it's where the very beginnings of her character, Tallulah, were developed. She talks about working in Australia and getting addicted to street performing, using her tenacity as a street performer to improve her stand-up comedy act, and being influenced by Abby Collins, who is featured in our episode 122 of this podcast, and how it changed her thinking about female street performers. Al asked her a great question, wondering, how is it different to be a female performer that male performers would have no idea about? As a male performer, I found the answer very interesting and can better appreciate some unique challenges that female performers have to deal with. Sharon has a great perspective on the world of street theater, as well as the role of females in it. This conversation is peppered with some amazing stories and insight into our industry from one of the strongest acts out there, and now, the newest inductee into the Busker Hall of Fame. Hello, Sharon. Hello, Al. What's up? Not much. So, yeah, other, uh, otherwise being verbally abused by strangers in my laundry. That's right. good times. You just told me a funny story about a lady giving you shit for not wearing a mask in your laundry room, and she didn't even live in the building. No, she just randomly came in to use the building's laundry, doesn't live there, and then gave me shit for not wearing a mask in my laundry room. The irony is you were wanting to launder your masks. Yeah, my masks were in the laundry that she was blocking that I couldn't get out. Oh, man. That's crazy. It's great. Welcome to Canada. (laughs) (laughs) Home of friendly people. So we're here with Sharon Mahoney. Uh, This is the uh, Stories from the Pitch podcast, special podcast with Sharon Mahoney, because uh, this year, Sharon is the inductee to the Busker Hall of Fame 2021. Isn't that cool? (laughs) Woohoo! <laughs> I want I every pitch I go on from now on, everybody better just fucking kneel. Yeah, yeah. You, you gotta get you gotta get the <laughs> Busker Hall of Fame t-shirt, inductee. I want a, a tiara. Yeah, like a, yeah. Yeah. Totally. You definitely, I'm sure you have a, a, a bunch of those. <laughs> yeah. I've been waiting for this moment my whole career, Al. Well, I mean, I called you the other day to tell you the news and you were quite happy. Tell me, uh how you felt when I told you the news? Oh, well, it's really, it's actually very sweet. I mean, I don't, like I said, I don't pay much attention. I was like, is there money involved? And you're, you're like, <laughs> no, no, no. I'm like, I'm like, there's no money. There's no prize money. You're like, no, Sharon. It's, uh, I'm like, oh, okay. Um, but I mean, no, it's sweet. Like the fact that I guess it's the people, the peers vote. So, mm-hmm. you know, yeah, it's cool. You had some 30-something votes, and um, just behind you was the Flying Dutchman, Anthony Living Space, and Jim Cellini. So uh, that's pretty good company, that's right? good company. That's amazing company, actually. Like, yeah, definitely, like, and all of those, uh, well, especially um, Living Space is a good friend of mine, and mm-hmm. I think he's genius. So, and then also the Flying Dutchman, I know them. Uh, quite well they're fantastic so I mean it that's it's a bit in one hand it's really nice but it's also a bit like you know like how can you sort of say one person is one act or whatever you know I guess it just comes down to uh, who has more friends and (laughs) yeah I guess uh, the the people came out for you this year which is cool and uh, I think you were you were actually nominated by Amy Amy Saunders Oh, she's, Amy's fantastic. Actually, I thought Amy would be a really great person to be, um, yeah, a representative on this as well, because she's, she's a real, she's not only has she done a lot for street theater, but she's also really taken her career to a whole other level. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she actually got a lot of votes as well. Uh, She was nominated. She was nominated by someone else, but uh, yeah, she got a lot of votes as well. Lots of people got a lot of votes, but, uh, but you got the most. So. I got the most. <laughs> <laughs> so it's all, it's all about Sharon, 2021. That's right. <laughs> Sharon yeah. 19, that's going to be the new virus. Right. Yeah. Sharon 19. People will have to get a vaccine for me. 
Yeah. And uh, and 2021, I don't know how many years, I think maybe the inductee thing started in like 2014 or something, but you're the first female inductee. Um, so cool. that's pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. We got some, uh, put some, some pheromones all over it. <laughs> is that what it is? <laughs> yeah. Just spray. I just like a cat. I'll just kind of spray all over it. Just right. mark some territory. Right. No, that's sweet. That's really cool. Yeah. Yeah. It's cool. So, uh, so I wanted to chat to you about a little bit about your career and, um, uh, when, first of all, when's the last time you did a street show? Oh, we, I did some in last summer. We were able to do some here in Vancouver. Well, last summer was awesome in Vancouver. We had like no cases. Right. Uh, we got our cases down to like, we did really well last summer. And um, we were able to do like socially distant shows. So you couldn't have like a crowd of everyone standing next yeah, to each other, yeah. but you could have people like sitting all over in different parts of the lawn. Um, and so English I did, Bay. yeah, yeah. So I did some shows. It's a perfect Down pitch there, for a so perfect awesome. pitch for a social distance show. Yeah, it's beautiful. Yeah, and um, yeah, so that's the last time I did a show. Right on. Yeah, yeah. The um, that's that's kind of how it is these days. Is you got to find a spot where people can spread out, like a lot of stairs or a park or grass, a hill. And uh, yeah. that's just that's just how it is. That's that's what I've been doing down in Florida is is working a spot that has like tables and chairs and benches and there's just a bunch of places for people to stand and sit and shade and trees and whatever. And uh, right. you know, there's no there's no edge. You know, it's just yeah. people. And yeah. <laughs> it's kind of nice though. Do you do you find that there's also some good things that come from that as well, or do you just yeah. do you miss having everyone packed in? I like having them packed in. I don't miss um, constantly asking them to move. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> totally. You know, I'm sure I'll yeah. get back to doing that because it's, yeah. you know, it's kind of one of my specialties is packing the crowd in. Yeah. But uh, but for now, uh, I think it's fine. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's great you're doing that. Yeah. I don't want to push people too hard. You know, they're, everyone's different. People, yeah. some people are comfortable. Other people are not comfortable next to each other. So... Yep. You know, and there's definitely been times in the past when it's been like a hot day and there's, you know, places where you can do a show where you can't get people in the sun, but you can have them stand wherever they want. So it's kind of like that. Yeah. You know, those, those shows yeah. where you just let people stand wherever they want. And um, yeah, it works. Still works. Yeah, I found and uh, from my experience from doing it last summer, too, it felt like if I if I just left people alone they were, they felt more comfortable getting involved. And um, it was one of those things like, I remember performing in New Zealand for the first time, at just doing street shows down there. And it felt like New Zealanders sometimes will stand much further back. And a lot of the times they like having their space. Mm. But I was so used to doing so many shows in Australia where it's like, that is just a sign of everyone's going to walk when you're done. Right. But then in New Zealand, it's like people would stand like so far away from each other and all over, but they'd all come and up afterwards. Yeah. So it, it really was not indicative of that. And I found that was a similar sort of thing here last year where people were all different places and, you know, spatially all over but i found that if i left them alone they were more apt to coming up and being um receptive at the end of the show so yeah and um did you make any adjustments to your show to um to for the pandemic um what i i asked all of my volunteers at the time like do you want uh of course it was a, for me because my show is so volunteer based and I mean, Canada last summer was very much like New Zealand in a way that we had like no, no cases right. in BC. Like we were, we were doing really well at that time. Right. Um, so, but I still at that, it would ask all of my volunteers, like, are you, you know, are you perfectly comfortable coming up? I know that it's, um, you know, we, everything considering. And then I had like, I, I asked them if they wanted to wear like, PPE and I had right. you know like all the shields and then I had like hand sanitizers and gloves and I had like some condoms all sorts of stuff I'm like look just <laughs> lather yourself up do what you need to do to feel protected yeah. but yeah. nobody seemed to really mind um again like last year it was it was really in BC it was really uh we yeah, had it yeah. really under control so I don't know what it will be like um 
this summer is we're, we're yeah. in a third wave right now. So who's to say? Um, when do you think will be the next time you get out on the street? I'm hoping, um, well, this summer we're booked to do um, the Festival of Fools together. Yeah, so Burlington. I'm, yeah, yeah, I know. So I'm really excited that I've never done that festival before. And Woody's tried to have me a few different years. And I was supposed to go last year. And of course, that didn't work out. But I just got my first uh, vaccination. And mm. so um, I plan to be fully vaccinated before then. And I'm doing everything I can to make sure that happens. So Great. that is, uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I'm scheduled. I have an appointment on May 5th for to get my first shot. Nice. So yeah, I think I think we're going to run into that, you know, because that's the first festival that I've um, been booked for. That's like, hey, you got to be vaccinated if you want to come. Yeah, uh, I think that's that might be a running theme for a while. Yeah, and I think I mean personally, I want to be vaccinated if I'm going to be in an environment and travel yeah. like that. Like I just feel better too. But I think um, I do think that there'll be some level of vaccination passports to what degree I don't know but mm. I think there will be for certain things but yeah. they just announced recently that if you are a fully vaccinated American this summer you can travel to Europe and not have to quarantine I heard that I heard that yeah I'd, I'd, lo I'd love that if they do that for Australia because <laughs> I've been wanting to yeah. go and I just I still can't it's like two weeks quarantine it's three thousand bucks for a hotel and, yeah it's crazy um, and last time I looked, the, 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 um, the only tickets that were available were first class tickets. It's crazy. <laughs> yeah. It's crazy. Those, those aren't really affordable. Uh, you no. know, some, you know, in regular times, maybe it's splurge, but not, yeah. not right now. <laughs> no, no, it's crazy. It's real crazy. Yeah. So anyway, I'm looking forward to getting out there uh, again soon. And I'm definitely looking forward to Burlington, um, which is like, Last time I did it, it was like the dark horse of the year. Like it was, I had all these different gigs and festivals lined up and Burlington was the best one I did. So. That's all, well, I've heard, I've heard nothing but good things about it. And yeah. I mean, I always find too, that when there is a street performer who's has a real mm -hmm. involvement in organizing it, mm -hmm. that the majority of the time there's, it's always, there's a real positive to it because they get it, right? They understand oh, yeah. how to do it. So yeah, yeah, it'll be fun. Yeah, you don't, you know, you're not performing on the patio of Pizza Pizza. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yep. You know, that happens. Uh, yeah, so because, you know, street performers, they know what a good pitch looks like and, you know, how it's going to work and where the crowd's, crowd's going to stand and what PA you're going to need and what you're going to need after the show, before the show and in the green room and how nice you like your hotel and how you like to get picked up at the airport and just sure all that stuff, yeah. you know? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's, a lot of time that stuff gets missed. Yep. Yeah. But yeah, it's pretty exciting. Why don't you just perform here on this alleyway where there's some junkies? And right. if you do the show here, we'll get all these people to come. Yeah. And then it'll be really good for this business over here. It's like, yeah, yeah it's not going to happen. Yeah, you attract the people. No, yeah. you supply the people, we'll entertain them. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Well, we had a pitch once that was literally right beside a, a toilet. Mm. So you'd be in, like, you'd be doing a show and you'd just hear, like, and it was one of those toilets that was, like, <laughs> it, it sounded like a, a it sounded like a spaceship was launching every time it flushed. Oh, man. So it was just, like, like yeah, this is, uh, it was, it was, it was atmosphere, definitely. <laughs> it provided some good comedy, that's for sure. Right. Uh, that sounds like Covent Garden. There's that uh, there's that toilet right by the pitch, and every time, yeah. <laughs> whenever Pepe would be performing, someone would come out and he'd give him a big round of applause. <laughs> Those yeah. toilets are dodgy. I've been down there sometimes, and I was just sort. I felt like getting a vaccine after I come out yeah. of those Covent Garden toilets. Yeah, no, it's it's like the, the the central hub for every London homeless person. It's like going into somebody's intestines going in there. It's mm. so gross. Nice. It's really bad. Nice analogy. Yeah. <laughs> it's like the inside of a bum's asshole. <laughs> <laughs> the bowels of London. Uh, it's true. And that's where Pepe lives now. Yeah. <laughs> it's, isn't that wild, hey? Yeah. It is. Wow. So how did you uh, come into street performing, Sharon? Um, well, I, um, I did... What, when I finished high school, I always wanted to be like an improviser 
and I, I was really like taken with Saturday Night Live. And so I just, you know, did a lot of researching and was like, okay, a lot of those people from Saturday Night Live, they started from Second City. Mm -hmm. And so right after I finished high school, um, I'm from Toronto originally. So I went to the second city in Toronto that used to be at the old fire hall and they had these courses. So I was just mm -hmm. like signed up and I did every improvisational acting course I could do there. And then um, I decided I wanted to do a degree in theater. So then I went back to university and then I did a degree in theater arts. In and Toronto. then in our, um, in, uh, in Quebec, actually. Ah, cool. So, and that was great because in our last year, we had uh, Mump and Smoot came and they did a whole year of clowning with us. And that was really, and that's when I really was like, oh, I really like this, uh, this character kind of acting and character clowning. Mm -hmm. And that's actually where the character for my street show was first developed was in that mump and smoot that last year of doing clowning with mump and smoot right. and it was uh striptease had just come out with uh, demi moore yeah i'm dating myself here but i wanted to be uh <laughs> i was i was this stripper clown who um was just also kind of like a bit clumsy and couldn't necessarily fully get it completely right she was a bit goofy right and so, so you had I worked yeah you had all of that before you came into street performing yeah yeah and then I um then when I moved out back out when I finished theater school and then I came out west I was going down to I was working actually on Granville Island and I would see the street performers there every day and I became friends with a bunch of them and I was just like this is really cool like who was guys, there uh so Bill Ferguson was there Mm -hmm. Byron Bertram was there. Jeremy Eaton was mm -hmm. there. Um, who else was there? I think David Aiken was there every now and then. Right. And let me see who else. They had, they used to have the comedy festival um, and they would have that, like the Vancouver comedy festival would have a street performing element to it as well. Mm -hmm. And so for years in the summertime, they would book street performers through the comedy festival. So I remember going to the comedy festival in Granville Island and they would bring in international acts. And that's actually, I think my first female act that I saw was uh, Cherie, 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 Cherie Vickers. Vickers. Yeah. Yeah. yeah cool. And she did the tits of fire. Uh -huh. And I remember that was the first woman I saw do a show. And I was like, Oh, that's and She was lovely. She was so cool. And they would bring in, I'm trying to think who else I saw down there. Uh, Dom Ferry came uh, one oh, right summer. On. That was awesome. I, he was the first person I saw that did following. And he, cause he came over for a tour and he did um, Edmonton street fest. And he had a whole Canada tour lined up yeah. and he came to Vancouver. And I think he did the comedy fest as well that year. And then I remember seeing him down at English Bay and I was like addicted. I'd go down right. every night and watch and just watching Dom do following. It's the perfect English pitch Bay. for following. It was, yeah. it was the most romantic thing I'd seen in the world because it was yeah. right, as you know, English Bay is right on the ocean. Sunset. And then the sunset is there. And then Dom would play all these, these great musical tracks. Mm -hmm. And uh, he'd just do like 20 minutes of following. And I was just like, oh my God, I'm, I'm hooked. This is, this is <laughs> awesome. I mean, and, uh, and did you start, is that when you started? Yeah, I, um, what I remember I had, so I remember it was actually Dom that I was talking to. He was, Dom was great. I mean, as you know, he was kind of like the grandfather of street yeah, performing, totally. especially in Australia and that mm -hmm. area. And so he was so lovely and we would talk a lot. And uh, I was like, you know, I don't really have a lot of circus skill. And I just see that there's, you know, like it seems like everybody's got all this circus skill. And he was like, I told him like my background in, in theater and clowning. And he was like, mm. just do what you know and he said, I remember him telling me this story once where he said that if you can go out with an envelope and do a show with an envelope, he said, that's really where you want to be. He mm -hmm. said, and I remember always thinking that of just like making something from nothing was that idea. I think, uh, I think Paddy Branwell's had a, a, his show, his finale was, I think, tearing the envelope. So, because I think I think that was what I always heard is that Patty had the smallest kit 
around he had this box that was like this big and inside it had an envelope with you know whatever in it that's great and, uh, <laughs> but yeah it's pretty cool i mean dom dom could do following you know um you don't need any props to do that you know yeah. unless you want to do gags and obviously yeah. unless you want to have music but yeah. um but yeah it's it's a pretty pure art form yeah and so he was like look he, he's like you're what you have right now and your skill um you know purse is that you've got uh this, this why don't you make a show based on this character mm -hmm. and that you that you did with with mountain smooth and i was kind of like oh you, wow okay i guess and and then so we started like talking about ideas and and then um yeah so then i just sort of went out and i just played around and mm. it was the back in those days, Granville Island, you probably remember this because you used to come back to Canada in those days. This oh, yeah. is in the this is in the late 90s. But uh, Granville Island had um, in the back pitch, they were the um, there's the triangle in the front and then there's the courtyard. But they yeah. also had the the pit right. where it was like the stairs yeah. and then there was a small little thing. So you could do. They would have like close up magic shows down there or, yeah. and it, what was great is that you could book the pit for like two hours. Cause no one wanted and it. <laughs> no one wanted it. Yeah. And I was like, oh, this is great. I'll do that. I'll take that pit every day for two hours. And I just had a 10 minute little piece, but I did like 20, 10 minute, like I was nice. just pumping out all these 10 minutes. And that was the best place to learn because it was just repetition. And wow. just really doing it over and over and over again, and um, yeah, that was that was sort of where I started from it. So you cut your teeth on the pit. Yeah. Wow, yeah. that's awesome. I thought you were going to say like um, you know Granville Island or the art gallery, because um, I remember when I first stopped in Vancouver, Byron was doing shows on Robson Street, like on the sidewalk. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, and he he showed me English Bay and everything else, and I'm like why are you doing shows on the sidewalk, Byron? <laughs> like, he was doing these big, these big shows at English Bay and these big shows at Granville Island. And then in the daytime, in the nighttime, he would go up to Robson Street and do these shows for like 20 people. And I'm like, why, what are you doing that for, Byron? <laughs> it's hilarious he had the, it was like the addiction though wasn't it it was yeah, just like yeah. i gotta show show it was show. Work, remember that work. fred flintstone when it was fred flintstone got addicted to gambling and he was like bet 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 it's like you could see it in people's eyes when they get that uh yeah. drug addiction to it and mm -hmm. it was like but i do remember those days and i remember going to english bay and it was like uh, Bill Ferguson, Rick Lewis as well. I remember seeing Rick Lewis at that time in the late mm. 90s. And I was like, Rick Lewis would do that great bit where he'd steal somebody's watch mm -hmm. uh, and the audience and they wouldn't notice it. And at the end, he'd be on the top of the unicycle and he's like, is this, you pull out the watch. And I it was like, it was just awesome. It was, it was literally, like, I felt like a kid in a candy store. It yeah. was, it was amazing. And um, yeah, so English Bay, after I would do, uh, I'd do all these shows in the pit, and then I'd run down to English Bay and just watch the shows that summer. And there was, uh, yeah, it was, it was, I was really privileged to have a lot of greats that came in for mm. the comedy festival as well. So yeah, it was awesome. Can you, can you remember like a turning point or something that really made a huge difference to you in your show or like a revelation, something that changed everything for you? I don't know that there was like a moment. I think it was several moments over time. It was like, you, you know how when you're like, and the same thing with stand up. I think you have these like, you sort of hit plateaus and then you keep plugging along. It's, it's like you're, you know, you're, it's like you're hammering a brick and yeah. you're just and then all of a sudden something breaks and you come up a little bit mm -hmm. but then you keep on that plateau and then something comes up it i always feel like it's it's the long game you know mm -hmm. like it's a really it it's this it is really the school of hard knocks because yeah. you, you know you have to in order to get it you have to do it and it's even after all the you know years of stand up i still think that street performing is probably the hardest thing i've ever done it's, it's it is hard <laughs> yeah yeah and um and yeah that, i mean that's always been my my philosophy is you got to work a lot of pitches you know that's how you get good at it 
you got to yeah. work and you got to figure out every pitch so that when you show up on a pitch before you even start you know what to do you know you yeah. know what kind of pitch it is where the people are and where to put them and and all that you know and that's being adaptable is is a huge strength for a street performer but you're so good at that like i think you have always seen the the science in it like you're you have a really good brain for looking at as something and going this goes here this is where you want to be this here whatnot and i my brain is more like i'll just show up and just kind of be like <laughs> sort of like oh my god okay i'll just start, yeah. i'll just act like an idiot and see what happens and so I but do, yeah yeah i have a so, like i have a secret sense i can i can yeah. sense i can sense how long i should perform for by how fast people are walking it's great <laughs> see that's that's really like and it's interesting to see how different people work and how they're it's all like how your brain works and mm -hmm. you know but um i mean you're absolutely right i think the more pitches that you do all over the world the more it it also gives you a sense of um and i noticed that with stand-up too i mean even though i started stand-up before i started doing street performing i definitely found that you know of when i would after several years of street performing and going these pitches all over the world, when you would walk into a comedy club, you'd carry that under your, you know, in, in your belt, mm -hmm. you'd walk on stage oh, yeah. and you have this thing where you like, I've, I've performed in the craziest places and I'm bringing that with me on stage. Yeah. And it does give you a sense of uh, a little bit of fearlessness or, yeah. um, you know, strength. It's just and, another pitch. Um, yeah. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's cool. And uh, you just, it, it, you know, you feel more comfortable on stage just because you're used to being in front of people and yeah. and anything happens, you know, and, and, you know, obviously a lot more stuff can happen out on the street than inside a comedy club. You know, the, Absolutely. Yeah. And then the fact that in a comedy club, people have paid and they're there waiting mm. for you, like they're not going anywhere. And, mm. Um, you know, where half of your job in street performing is getting people to want to be there and mm -hmm. watch you, and then you have to get them to pay. So there's so much going on in doing a successful street show. But so um, yeah. what are the, what are some of the places that, um, some of the other places other than Vancouver that you went in your early career? Well, that first, after I was like my goal, after doing, uh, you know, getting some, I had like a, you know, 25 minute show, I think I had put together. And I was just like, I want to go to Australia. I want to go to Australia. And, and I remember, because remember, we did uh, Edmonton Fringe together. Uh -huh. That would have been, that would have been 99. That was a classic because uh, JP, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. 98 or 99 yeah. and JP was living in my closet in Vancouver <laughs> I had this I had this great walk-in closet and he was staying somewhere in this shitty hostel and uh and you know he was we were hanging out all the time and he was you know helping me with street show and we were talking loads and I was just like JP this is ridiculous like my closet is bigger than the room that you're staying right. in like just and so you even have a door that you can close like you just so it was a classic because he looked like jesus and i always laughed at him <laughs> I'm like i have jesus living in my closet all summer so but yeah. then i remember he you know then when i came and when i first saw you in edmonton you had like these ladies massaging your fingers <laughs> at, like do you remember that i, I don't like, really remember but uh but i remember great. you telling me that story before you said that you showed up and <laughs> some, some girls were massaging my hands or something <laughs> I was like, oh, you must be Al. And you had like these, li like literally just giving you a, 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 a finger massage. I was like, I don't know what's going on, but I, I think I know who you are. And then um, we JP were- JP had talked about me or? Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah, right. JP. Because you and JP were really good friends um, oh, yeah. from Australia. And um, anyway, so I remember us even talking then. And I was saying to you, like, I really want to go to Australia. Mm -hmm. And I remember you saying um, everything that you hear about Australia, believe it, because everyone <laughs> is just like Australia is really hard, like it's really hard. Right. And um, and so but that just made me want to do it even more. Like I was just like I wanted to go there and and uh, at least face it. If you can do a show in Australia and make a good living, you can do a show anywhere. Yeah. Okay. You can go to Kuwait. You can go to Siberia. 
if you can do a show, like if you can talk to zero people for 20 minutes before you get one person, yeah, you can do a show anywhere. Because I remember, I remember doing Run Them All for the first time. And this, I just hear this, show us your tits, you can't. <laughs> and I look out and I swear to God, it was like a grandmother pushing a pram with a baby. Oh, and man. I was like, it's like far out. Australia is hardcore. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, that's pretty funny. You should have a shirt that says that on it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just get it tattooed on my tits, yeah. actually. Just so walk that, around with no shirt. So that first year you came to Edmonton, um, did yeah. you go other places in Canada or did you go to Edinburgh or anything that year? Um, that, that after I did my first tour in Australia, then I came back to Canada and then I went mm -hmm. to Edinburgh that summer. And um, yeah, that was pretty awesome too. Cause that feels when, like, yeah. it feels like the golden years, doesn't it? Well, I, it's funny because I think so, but then I do remember even meeting performers at that time and they would talk about the like 80s. their golden years, yeah, yeah. but they were like, oh, it's so different now. So the eighties were like the, the peak of this and, you know, oh, yeah. I think we all just have nostalgia about the time that we, when we learned and when we came into it. Yeah. Um, exactly it's like oh you remember it being so great but honestly yeah. the shows you did two years ago are probably way better than the shows you did back then yeah absolutely yeah. and I think it's when you're young uh or younger and you're learning there's that you know the excitement of the newness mm. of it and I do think that I mean I remember the first time that I this sounds so funny but it's actually really sweet like I used to work in a job where I would make you know, 750 an hour. And then I went out and I would, you know, make the same amount of money in a, <laughs> you know, and in, in going out and doing like a 20 minute show in the pit that yeah. I would make all day. And I just remember going, Oh my God, I'm going to be, this is great. I can't believe it. And like, but it was so beautiful because that was like, it's not like I was making loads of money, but in comparison, it mm. was like, it was such a, a revelation. And then I think mm. there's that period of when you first start doing it and everything's so new and exciting and you do start having the financial freedom that you get from doing something you love is, is like, it's so exciting. And then I think sometimes what happens is that the longer you do it, you start setting up expectations in your head right and then you almost there's a you can get entitled about what you feel mm -hmm. your worth is or what you know and um that's i think what happens that's part of why when i look back and i think oh those people might go those were the golden days but i think it was also maybe where our yeah. headset was at too well our time is important um and you know when you go into a gig or you go into an event and they want to pay you you know diddly squat it's like yeah oh but, so for sure but for on sure. the street you just can't have those expectations on the street that's it you can that's have the it. hopes you can hope that you're gonna you know do well yeah. but yeah. you can't really expect it you can't be entitled no. uh, and like you can have confidence and like you say you can have you know hope but it, there's there's no guarantees of and no. that's also the that's also why you like it mm-hmm so it's it could every be, time you go out. It could be Edmonton Fringe, Friday night, eight o'clock, you're halfway through your show, and then there's an ambulance and it rains and you yeah. get nothing. <laughs> you <know>? Exactly. <laughs> there's no guarantees, none. Yeah. So I think that's what it, it is like every time you go out, you're that's the that's why there's that adrenaline rush because and that's probably why Pete you get addicted to it. Because if it was that's mm -hmm. why you know you leave doing a nine to five job because that's predictable you know what's pretty much going to happen day it's in day the, out. it's the instant reward of a tip so because what a tip says is i like you yeah you know and there's and you get a bunch of those tips people saying i like you immediately after you've just done what you like doing yeah so it's yeah it's addictive yeah it, it, it's the affirmation, I think, too, like, and that's why I do think that, um, like, I've performed for a lot of different areas where there's cruise ship passengers, and a lot of the cruise ship passengers are American tourists, mm. and that's the one thing that I always really admired about, 
you know, a lot of people really, you know, slam Americans at times. But yeah. I think that sometimes it's unfair because the one thing I always really appreciate about Americans is that, I mean, as much as capitalism, you know, of course, when it's taken to extreme is, you know, can is not necessarily awesome either. But the idea of it is work really hard, that thinking out of the box, taking a risk, uh, building something, taking a chance and, and going for it. And, and that what I find the most people that have been really rewarding towards me in a financial sense has been Americans. And I mm. think it's because they like, they admire that you've gone outside of the box. They admire that you've gone outside of the norm. You've taken a chance and you've invested in yourself. They love mm -hmm. that because it's really what their whole it's the American dream. It is. And, and that's the one thing that I do really love about uh, like the, the idea of that. And I've always found that some of my best audience members have been American tourists. I mean, there's a reason why I live in the USA. It's the entertainment yeah. capital of the world. Yeah, yeah, and, absolutely. You know, my career is just like, psh, since I left Australia, you know what I mean? Until yeah. 2020, obviously. But yeah. <laughs> but yeah, there's the reason why I live here is because the opportunities are almost endless. It's, yeah. you know, you've got choices and people are, so happy when you come and perform at their thing or in yeah. their town or at their festival or whatever they're just like so happy and it's um, awesome and do you find that like i mean i, I don't want to sound like i'm whinging because i mean i'm very fortunate with canada we have all a lot of safety nets that i feel very privileged to have but having said that what i love about like when whenever i'm in the states or when i was like living in los angeles people will talk to you anybody will talk to you like yeah. it doesn't matter who you are. Like I'll be sitting at a car wash and people will just start talking to you and telling you all. And like that just, it's, it's just people don't do that everywhere. And there's something yeah. about that that I love. I noticed that it's like that in Australia too. A lot of people just talk to each other. Um, yes, definitely parts of the US. I happen to live in Boston and Boston isn't like that. Yeah. Um, which is, I don't know why. It's just not like that. It's, I don't know. It's, it's. I can't really understand why, but it isn't. You don't just talk to people. When you do talk to someone, they're like, what? Yeah. You know? <laughs> but, Boston uh, has, but yeah. Boston has that real Irish history as well, I think. Mm -hmm. So there's sort of that real, like, there's a little bit more of like, um, there's a lot more for America. I think there's a little bit more of a, uh, a banter element to it there. And people are a little bit, maybe... There's a, a tough exterior, but there's a real, if mm -hmm. I think, you know, I, I just think that uh, from my experience of being there and the people that I know that are from there, that uh, it, it can tend to have that kind of like, yeah, go fuck mm -hmm. yourself sort of thing. But then when you get to know people and they like you, yeah. they're really yeah. genuine. You that's, know, there's that's no. Like, yeah, that's like Australia too. Yeah. Um, but um, like I found when I, when I, because my first year overseas i went to like i went to canada i went to america i went to europe went to uh edinburgh and london and and um and copenhagen amsterdam all over the place and the next year i came back to the states because i felt like my show just worked it like locked in here um do, do you have a favorite place where you think your show just like like just works in that in that place ah uh, um well i think like I think like Victoria, the Inner Harbor, I also just because I worked it so much mm -hmm. that you get an idea of how you can play certain, you're like, this works when I do this. And then you got the upper balcony. So you're mm -hmm. able to, and then I, because there had so many American tourists there, I was able to write a lot of jokes that worked mm -hmm. for that crowd. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I've had wonderful shows there. Um, I'm trying to mm -hmm. think. I mean, I, I like, I like pitches sometimes where there's a, a little element of a craziness. I used to actually really like circular key, the old circular key pitch in front of the MCA. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Because you could get everyone to, and that's in a way a little bit similar to English Bay mm -hmm. in the sense that you could get everyone seated on the grass. I mean, it's all renovated now. Feels so it's familiar. completely different. Yeah. But, 
back then I just remember it was like you could and you could really get away with stuff there that you couldn't get away with in yeah. other pitches. That's true. And even that. even Darling Harbour, like right yeah. around the other side, you could you could yeah. say you could say more stuff at Circular Key than you could at Darling Harbour. Yeah. And there was always a, like Darling Harbor was very gentrified. So you had a certain clientele that was there where Circular Key was just, it was just a bit of everything. And yeah. that, I found that a bit more exciting. It was, well, it was, yeah, it's a ferry terminal. So there's people coming in yeah. from all different places and it's a yeah. tourist haven. So yeah, yeah, it's, it's a pretty, uh, that's where I met Bruce Bingstein. <laughs> oh, that's hilarious. I did, so did he see your show? Is that how you met him? Yeah, him, right. he's he's like entourage. We're at my show, and uh, I actually picked a couple of his bodyguards to be volunteers, and I didn't realize until yeah. afterwards. But uh, yeah, that was that was that was the initial introduction. That was pretty cool. That's great. Yeah, but what about? Uh, do you have any good stories from Australia? Any any cool weird things that happened? Oh God, I mean, where do I start? I've been like thinking of like, I mean. The funny thing about Australia is that it does toughen you up a lot, as you know. I mean, I've had so many. I remember performing in um, Port Ferry. That mm -hmm. I did that the first. That might have been in like 2000. And I remember it was just so drunk the one night. And you know uh, how you guys have all those terraces on your uh -huh. your bars, and you. And <laughs> I remember being up on the two high. And this guy chucks a beer bottle at me and it hit me right in the head as I was doing it. What? And then, yeah, I was juggling fire and a beer bottle came and just smashed me right in the head. And then he didn't said, show us your tits, you can't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it, it, I didn't get hurt, nothing. And then everyone felt so like they were, all the people, they were just like, oh my God, I, I had like the best hat I'd ever had. Yeah. And then Rusty Balls was with me. And Rusty got a big, he was just like, so he saw what happened. And then Rusty's like, Ian, I got an idea. Why don't we fucking stage this? So he wanted to go up every show and just try and like, just start chucking beer bottles at my head. And then we were supposed to split the, the I'm like, oh, yeah, that's boy. not going to happen, Rusty. But yeah, um, Rusty. so just crazy stuff like that. I mean, I remember being like strangulated at one time. Mitch was there. This is in, in Darling Harbor where this volunteer once he took the, my change bag and then tied it off and was like strangling me on the pitch. Oh. And then, and then I remember Mitch was like, uh, he was, I, I just remember Mitch being there and then he just, this is my cousin. It. This is You're, my cousin, yeah. by the way, my cousin, Mitch, we used to have and a Mitch. double act. Oh my God, Mitch, who, uh, that's the funny thing with street performing. I was like, I was never knew that Mitch, I just thought Mitch didn't even like me at all. And then all of a sudden, when he saw that I was being hurt, he just like beat the crap out of this guy. I was like, oh, yeah. I guess Mitch likes. And then afterwards, Mitch was just kind of like, you know, well, it is. It's that kind of mentality of like, well, you you are one of us, you know. Yeah. So, uh, Mitch has got the biggest heart in the world and he's he loves a scuffle. Yeah. 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 No, I, I think he was afterwards. I think he was just like, that was great. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, Kind yeah. of think of other funny things that happen in Australia. I mean, there's so many crazy things you almost forget. Like, oh my God, like just insanity. I think this is just Australia does drunk really well. Like, I don't think anybody does bogan better than Australia. Yeah, I, I, I've thought I've never had more violent encounters than I have in Australia. Um, yeah. Growing up and being a street performer there. Um, but I think, I think what it is, is that people don't have the fear of getting shot in yeah. Australia. Um, yeah. So that they, they feel like they can act like a dick. They can start fights. Whereas if you do that here, you might just get shot. Yeah. Or, you know, yeah. <laughs> it's also very heavily policed, um, yeah. the United States, where I do find that like in, like I remember being up in Surfers Paris. What was it? Well, they used to always call it Sufferers and Parasites. Sufferers. But I, I, yeah. <laughs> I remember doing shows up there and it was, I didn't even know what schoolies was. And I ended up doing shows uh, during schoolies. I oh still man. have PTSD from it. It was horrible. Yeah. But I remember, um, like I remember uh, I was had all my kit and I was getting it all ready. And then I felt this kind of thing on my back and I was just, I turn around, this guy's got his dick and he's out of his pants and he's just ramming it against my shoulder. Yeah. And uh and the police were just standing there laughing. And I was just like, that was the difference between yeah. like, 
Um, but it was great because then I had my whole Canada suit on yeah. and I remember I was just like, oh, I'm going to go complain about this. And then I just started marching with my Canada. It was like, it was like <laughs> Captain Canada was going to march and complain about a guy's penis. It was fantastic. Oh man. Yeah. I mean, if, for those that don't know what schoolies is, it's, uh, it's like, kind of like spring break. It's high schoolers, um, who, when they're done with, with grade 12, they all go to the Gold Coast uh, around just before Christmas time and have a big drunk orgy party and uh, and doing shows there I couldn't imagine I never went there and did shows it's horrible well I didn't know I did like the one or two shows and then someone explained to me what was going on and I was yeah. like okay I'm not this is this is brutal yeah Ugh, horrible anyway Suckers yeah and parasites yeah yeah the, you never know what you you know you never know what you're going to get when you do a street show but in Australia, it's it's tenfold. <laughs> yeah, it it nobody does bogan better than Australia. Like it is a, that it's it's amazing. It really is amazing. Yeah. yeah. Um, so you said that you developed. Um, which character did you develop first? Like, like the, the Miss Tallulah or the Canadian yeah. character? Yeah, the, the Tallulah character was based on the clown that I right. created in um, in theater school. So mm -hmm. I had that first and I was doing that for like the first, you know, year or two where I would just start as that character. Um, but then I was always sort of struggling because that character is definitely more high status, mm -hmm. which can work if you're just coming out and you're doing stuff. But when you have to get volunteers, mm -hmm. I found it really difficult. So um, I, rem I can't remember how it all started, but I do remember being in Fremantle and um and i was talking about this i know what it was i remember being in edinburgh i think it was that first summer and i had it was amy saunders mm -hmm. and might have been jackie algae as well and they would always and pepe and i think they would always take the piss out of me for being really canadian and um all of the things that I incorporated into that Canada character, they would like make fun of me continually for that. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, so then I was just sort of thinking about like, well, maybe that could be like, uh, because I was, I was trying to figure out ideas of how to make the show, the beginning of the show a little bit easier for me to get volunteers. Because mm -hmm. when I was at a festival setting, it was fine. But when I was doing like Street Street, it was really hard to get people to feel uh, comfortable enough to get involved in the show when you're mm -hmm. a really high status character. Right. So I was like, well, what if I was able to create some of that Sharon uh, character that they all make fun of me of, Right. but it would right. be a great, it's kind of a passive aggressive, lower character, lower status character. Yeah. All the so stories. then I had this idea. Yeah. Yeah. So I was talking with Jackie about it. We were in Fremantle. I think it was Jackie and Ronnie. And then Jackie was like, well, just do it. And I was like, and then I had this idea. This is before, um, this is before Glee. So it was before Sue Sylvester. Right. And I just had this idea of having a red track suit because it was just like clean and it was just red. It was representative yeah, yeah. of, it was this generic kind of character that, uh, was asexual almost mm -hmm. and that was a great foil for the second character so then I just remember going out and and I had I booked a slot for the pitch on Fremantle and it was Jackie was great in that way because Jackie was always super creative and always into taking risks and totally. she was just like she's like I dare you just to take your 45 minute slot and just play with that idea. She's like, don't even do a, sh a proper show. You don't right. even need to have it. And we went to Target and she's like, we'll get this. I bought this red tracksuit from Target. And she's like, just go out for 45 minutes and play with that idea. And it felt really great. And then Jackie afterwards was like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> so then it was, that was the, the sort of uh, idea of like going, oh, okay, well maybe I can kind of combine the two and then, um, and then it kind of made sense for me. Like it did kind of click. If I was to say that there was a moment that something clicked, I guess that could be one of them because then it did, I sort of realized, I mean, clowning is a lot of the character is really, it has to be you, but it's mm -hmm. sort of like an ex that part of you and then an exaggerated extreme form of it. So Tallulah was definitely that. 
but Sharon yeah. from Canada is also that. So it was like these two parts of my personality then amplified at either right. end times of the 10. Spectrum. That's it. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's cool. And, uh, and so what year was that when you were in Fremantle and you started doing that? Yeah, I think it was 2002, somewhere around there. Yeah. So if you, how long have you been street performing? Is it like 20 something years? Yeah, I think it's maybe 22, 22 years, maybe somewhere around there. Right. Yeah. And yeah. what would you say at this point? I mean, forget, forget about stand up and everything, but in street theater, what would you say is your specialty? Like, what are you best at? I think crowd work. Improv crowd work? Yeah, I think that's, if I was to say what would set me, what my strength is, I mm -hmm. definitely feel like I, those are the moments that I, th that's what I enjoy the mm -hmm. most. And I think that those, are the, and that's, but I think that also comes from having an improv background, maybe, and then having, but mm -hmm. it's a muscle, you know, like anything, it's like, the more that you do it, the better you, the more confident yeah. you, you feel like things just happen but I definitely feel like uh probably crowd work and just real crowd work where it's not like it's interesting because I just gave this um somebody asked me to do a seminar on crowd work for stand-up for people right. that were just starting so I really had to think about like what's interesting is that sometimes you have these skills it's like somebody saying how do you ride a bike? And you're like, well, I don't know. I've been doing it since I was five. I never really thought about how I actually do it. I just know I get on and I ride it. But when you yeah. try and break down, I mean, you've been doing this a lot with your, your, um, your, all your classes and stuff, but mm -hmm. it's something that I was like, oh, how do I act? How does it actually work? And then trying to explain it is difficult. Yeah. Yeah. And then, so I really thought about it and I was like, oh, it really is like, um, it's a conversation to a degree, but it's also really trying to listen, but not only listen, but like watching is listening. So it was a lot of like, you know, keeping obviously the show going and whatnot. But then when you see stuff happen and you're just like, oh my God, that's just like, and clowning was a lot about the gifts of the gods. Like what is the, and I remember doing one of my final presentations for that, clown character that I did I had to do like this uh strip routine and then I remember Mump and Smoot they were just like I, because I could do these these like then they would add things on it to make it more difficult because then when you you put that character where they're stressed then funny things can come from it so yeah, then yeah. I, I remember I had to I had these coins lined up and then I was like had to do that old <laughs> trick so I was doing this but I still had to try and do like the clown had the strip and then he was like okay do this now do this and then it got to the point where it's so ridiculous looking and then I had on these high heels and the high heel broke and um <laughs> and then it was like it was such a great moment because uh it just turned into total chaos but I remember after that I tried to reenact that and it was never gonna right like yeah, it was it's, never gonna it's hard never to gonna get work. the magic get the magic back twice yeah yeah so there was this whole thing about clowning was like you get these gifts from the gods and they they sometimes just come once and that's it so mm -hmm. i think that's the one thing that i really love is in crowd work and the spontaneity of like having these gifts from the the gods that come mm -hmm. and what you end up making of it is uh yeah, yeah that's the magic of that that's an important strength to have for stand-up um, and speaking of which, when did you start um, getting back into stand-up? Well, I started doing stand-up in, um, yeah, like the, it was actually, I started doing stand-up in the late 90s before I started doing street performing. And I, then when I started doing street performing, it's just like consumed, as you know, it's like so all-consuming that I just, that sort of took over. And mm -hmm. then, um, but I, I, so I guess I took maybe a couple years off of stand up. But then when I, then I kept, went back at it, you know, maybe I took like maybe when I started touring, like when I went to Australia the first time, I didn't do any stand up in Australia or anything mm -hmm. like that that year. Um, and, and then, but then after uh, my street performing was sort of just like, it, like I started to get more consistent work and I didn't have to necessarily grind as as much right. then I was like really missed kind of having 
another outlet. So then I mm. would always sort of pop in and do sets or, you know, but then I really started getting back into it. Um, um, probably about 15 years ago, I really started like constantly going, okay, I need mm. to do like three sets a week, or I need to do at least three sets a week or whatnot. And then, um, yeah. And then definitely more in the last every, like the last 10 years and I started doing it more and then like the last six years and then um you know every sort of year it just kept getting more where I was pushing more at it and getting more involved in it and you know but yeah. the two overlap quite a lot there's a which, lot of overlap. Um, which do you like better it's hard to say this sounds really corny but it's like somebody saying like what kids do you, you have kids and you're like <laughs> which kid do you like better and you're like I like all my kids equally right but Nathan's the best but like no yeah, yeah. um I, it's funny because I mean in a way right now uh, there's like right now I'm I, what I will say that I love about stand-up is that you I'm at the point in stand-up where I am able to a lot of the bullshit like when you're first getting into stand-up for me anyways there's so much um politics and clickiness that's involved mm -hmm. in it that it sometimes that can be harder than actually just the actual so doing are, it. so are streeties like better friends and colleagues than comedians they're different i think that street performers ultimately um i think this is my theory and i could be wrong i think street performing is so hard that if you're sitting on a pitch with somebody for five hours a day and regardless of whether you like that person or don't like that person, there's this underlying kind of thing of like, yeah, but they're still part of this weird like yeah, camaraderie. circus. There's something there that I feel like in stand up, there's an element of that, but it's, it's diff it's not as much as, mm -hmm. I do think that street performing is so hard that, it, like I say, it's just there's that level of just going, well, you might not like that person, but, you know, there you, you have to have this, there's this sense of respect that they're like, yeah, but they're still doing it. And we're sitting on pitch together for six hours a day. Yeah. And you, so it's like when we talked about with Mitch, it's like, you know, you don't think they like you, but then all of a sudden <laughs> they got your back and you're like, well, that was weird, but it, it you know, but it isn't really. Yeah, yeah. So, and I think um, street performing is so volatile that like you are, you get physically assaulted, you get, you know, all sorts of crazy things happen that there is this element of kind of going, well, I know how that feels. So, I mean, I know for myself when I'm on a pitch and I see another performer who's, uh experiencing something like that like i get super protective mm -hmm. it, it's like the, this mother bear comes out where i'm just like um and and i totally. think that that like when, less, when someone's yeah. getting heckled you want to go and tackle the heckler yeah <laughs> you know? yeah absolutely and i i feel like um i don't know if it's just because the level of vulnerability and vitality is so high that anything could happen i mean mm you're so exposed in street performing so it's just different where you have uh there is this kind of sense of like um i don't know some people sort of say you know like in the army where it's kind of like that your army friends could make fun of the army but outsiders can't so it's kind of yeah. like the same thing where it's like i'll sit down with my friends and we'll make fun of it but then if somebody who doesn't do it slags it yeah. i'm like you go fuck yourself you don't know it's, how hard yeah, it is yeah. like oh, you know what i mean it's funny when you're sitting and someone's doing a show and, and some random person will come up to you and be like, this guy sucks. Yeah. You're like, that's, that's my friend over there, mate. Yeah. We're, like, we're, yeah. We think we're, we're buddies, like we're yeah. buddies. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I know. I know. How, how is the, how is it different um, out of being at a festival and being an indoor performer versus being an outdoor performer? Like, cause there's a lot of the times the streeties are all still there. Like, are you, will you go hang out with the street performers or will you go hang out with the comedians or like, I don't know. How's that Both. Work? I mean, I, I feel like I, I have friends. Some of my best friends are street performers. Some of my best friends are stand up comedians. Yeah. Um, some of my best friends are gastroenterologists. So <laughs> like, you know, it's like, I just, I like if people are, are, if I, if, if I like them, 
you know, but I, I think sometimes just as a result of like what you're doing, like, so if I'm, if I'm at, um, if I'm working clubs a lot, a lot of the times you're with those people. So just mm -hmm. by, as a, as a default of being there, you end up spending more time with them. Yeah. But I still love, like, you know, I would do, well, what was cool too, like in Adelaide, I was doing during the Fringe Festival, Gordo has this little comedy tent and um, bless him, Gordo has been so good to me. And like, he would just like, basically just say, you do, you do what you want. Like, and so I, like, I've had one or two shows and my show Thundercunt, I worked out in that tent where I yeah. it was just like, like every, that whole Adelaide festival, it was like, how many days is Adelaide? It's a month and a half. It's so it's like, yeah. So it was like 45 days. And like, it, there's only one night a week, Mondays where the garden is closed, but yeah. it was like every single night That's for great. a month and a half, I was in that tent literally doing like, six to seven uh wow. to eight comedy like spots a night That's just hashing out that material yeah. and then and then like doing it and then going oh i can't get this and and then sometimes i had buddies that were around that were that like from the stand-up scene i'd be like hey i'm doing this tent i'm really trying to work out this bit and i just can you come watch and and they'd come watch and then sometimes we'd sit down afterwards and go yeah. it's like like a math equation you're like okay and then and then sometimes you'd be working on this bit for like a week and you're like i can't i just can't there it's almost there but it's not and i'm trying yeah. to figure out how to do it and then all of a sudden you have this breakthrough where just you try something different or something uh, uh, spontaneously happens and it forces it to change mm -hmm. and then it lands and you're it is the best feeling in the world and yeah, you're just like finally. oh my god it's awesome yeah 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 so i think um but so there's a mix of things where it's like, but that tenacity of being able, I do think that I applied my street performing tenacity to the stand up, And that's why I was mm. able to sort of like, that's what you have to do to be a successful street performer is just, you know, it, a numbers game of just, you know, doing it over and over and over again until. Yeah. So um, I would say that to answer your question, um, both. And, and I think the two are awesome because. Yeah it's it's great to have you know i do think sometimes like people we're all weird but i mean the actors are weird if you're surrounded by actors all the time it's just kind of like it's like yeah but you're weird too you know like actors are super <laughs> weird they're super into themselves they're super yeah, yeah. like you know they're really there's a self-absorption about like that self-importance and then you're kind of like okay but then stand-ups can be weird and street performers or even we can be weird so i i like a bit of diversity because then it just <laughs> keeps it more interesting you just get different flavors of weirdness speaking of diversity um how is it different being a female performer like what kind of things do you run into that male performers would have no idea about uh well having your period during a show i think that's number one uh oh. it's 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 yeah that's it's actually a great discussion i uh, was talking about this is a classic when you're asking about like what funny things happened in australia i remember doing my show once and my tampon string was hanging out of my shorts the whole time oh. and i knew it and i refused to stop because i worked <laughs> so hard for that goddamn edge and circular key and i was like i cannot i tried and i was like there's nothing discreet about uh. it this tampon string is going to be it's going to be out for the whole show and then I did the too high so at the end I was like this and it was just the too high and then this like whoop, like just like oh, that man. and I made so much money I was like I'm going to do that every show that is fantastic <laughs> and a couple of people came up afterwards and they're like you know I'm like oh I know I know yeah, I know yeah. exactly what was going on yeah. oh, um, but just even something like that where you're like oh my god I've got my period I feel like shit um, I literally like I've got the worst cramps and I have to get out and do three shows a day and I have to carry all my gear around and I'm not I can't talk about it because it's like it's that feeling of like uh, you do I feel like it is sometimes if you I mean that was great about when more women in there were women before me which also I you know would say like Petra Massey and and Ronnie and Abby was Abigail was like a huge influence on me. She was fucking awesome. Mm -hmm. um, but at, when I started, 
there were less, it was like a period where women had sort of, the women that were on before me had gone on to do other things. So there was like, there weren't many mm -hmm. on, on the circuit mm -hmm. at that time. So then when more women started doing it, um, then it was awesome because it was, it was just that sort of thing of like, oh, Jesus, like just simple things of being able to talk about menstruation, mm -hmm. you know, and, and like, yeah. And, and you don't want to talk about it because you don't want to sound like you're whinging or you're complaining and you want to, you know, so just even something like that is, uh, yeah. and it, do you have a, do you have a feel unsafe? I do. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think, I think everybody does to a certain degree. And I don't think that, you know, that, uh, gender, if you're, if you're out there, you're vulnerable. Mm -hmm. I think, I do think that sometimes, um, definitely, I think as a, as a woman, um, I mean, I've never been a man surprise. I know everyone's surprised, but I've never been a man. So I can't say what it would be like. I can yeah. only tell you what my experiences have been. So in one hand, why I, the, the great thing about in one way, having four male volunteers is that even though some people would say like, Oh, you're taking a big risk, trusting those guys. Right. And you're being very vulnerable and trusting those guys and whatnot, whatever. But on the same hand, I always felt like if I pick the right guys, yeah, I, they also have my back. Totally. And no one wants to look like a dick in public. Yeah. Like in front of a crowd, they're all going to do what you tell them to do. And, yeah. Uh, and they're totally going to have you back because you're yeah. they're part of your thing now. You know. That's it. That's yeah. it. So I think that, um, yeah. I mean, I know. Everybody, I think everybody to a certain degree, like I say, whether you're a guy or a girl, you're going to have things happen to you. I mean, I think the biggest thing for women is that you are, I do think that I noticed this a lot, especially, you know, the first 10 years of my street performing career was that I really felt that the lines were different for women mm. than they were for men and not all bad. Like, right. Yeah, it, sometimes it would really piss me off, but then sometimes it was like a double-edged sword mm. where you could go, I could, I could push things in a certain way because I was a woman, mm -hmm. but also as a comedian, you go, oh, they're not going to let me do that. Right. Yeah. They're, you they're have judging, to read the they're, crowd. They're judging me differently. Like, and the same, and I even remember explaining this to um, one a street performer once in uh, a Canadian street performer where I was, he was like, yeah, but you get, you know, and I'm, I'm not the first woman at all to get male volunteers and that whole idea of playing with mm -hmm. sexuality. I mean, uh, like I say, it was like, you know, Petra has been around for she and, and Abby and um, who was the tits of, well, Sheree was the first woman I saw tits of mm -hmm. fire and, and uh, Shirley Sunflower. I mean, there's been so many it was so it's it's not like I came up with that idea it's just that I tried to make my own characters and make that my own mm -hmm. but I think what is interesting is that what I did really find was John guy was saying to me he's like yeah but you are getting guys up out of the audience and you're doing this and how could you do this and he was getting really like he really bothered him right. and then I had to break it down where I was like yeah but you take your shirt off in your show and you do all these jokes about, um, you know, your nipples. You do all these jokes about, you know, you know, pulling things over and it's going over your dick and how big your dick is. And, and you're doing, and there's, there's nothing wrong with that. But if you're going to do that, why do you think you are in any position to be judging what I'm doing? Mm. And he was like, I don't even understand how you can't even compare the two. And he was like, so I was like, no, you can but to me, I think what's fascinating is that um, we, when I would go out and when I first started, I think I, I used to wear these little hot shorts, these hot uh, short shorts and, mm -hmm. and this sort of like, really, it was actually a look at it now and it was really cute, but it's like, you know, and I had this like top that had this big star on it and these straps and I had these boots and, but it was, it was always like, why do women always have to play with their sexuality? Why are women always having to use their sexuality? And I remember going, you know, fuck you. Guys use their sexuality all the time. It's Absolutely. just never seen. It's never seen as sexuality. 
Right. Like if a guy in their show is taking their shirt off and is talking, you know, about their nipples and, and their crotch, and if they're getting a young female volunteer out and they're, they're playing with that idea of like, can I get a kiss here and kiss there? There's not, I don't have any problem with that, but that is male sexuality. Mm -hmm. But nobody sits back and says, why do guys always have to use their sexuality? I mean, right. can they not be, it's like, it, that to me it really bothered me for double a long standard. time. It was a total double standard. And it was, it was interesting to me, the lack of insight that anybody could have to kind of look. And, and even, even if a guy was going to go out and dress as an athlete, Mm -hmm. like but you're that is still a, in a way that's a guy playing with his sexuality right. it's yeah. it's a you know i mean it's so, still like even the super bowl last year uh, j-lo and shakira or whatever that got all kinds of controversy about what they were yeah. wearing and it's like yeah. what i watched this show shit. it was awesome <laughs> yeah it's ridiculous isn't it yeah. and then and then on the same hand you know i mean a perfect example would be you know, they, they're talking there. It's great that they're talking about this now, but um, like Britney Spears, where you go, that, that poor girl. I mean, I always, it's funny because I always have stuck up for Britney Spears mm -hmm. and everyone, so many people just thought it was like a lunatic. And now it's like all this movie came out and it's like this, it's like, oh, so people are actually starting, like the lens is changing and people are starting to think about things differently. And it's like, yeah. you know, that poor girl was like she was a child and this whole music industry made a song about like her sexuality mm -hmm. and um you know she was she was advertised for her virginity before she was even an adult and mm -hmm. then everyone just it was like they wanted to break her down and it was adults and this is it's not necessarily all like you do face as a woman you do face the judgment from men going why did this why that but i will tell you my biggest um roadblocks and not roadblocks how should i say this Obstacles, some, of my, some of my biggest criticism has been other women and mm. that's what has always like for me i was never surprised when men felt threatened or felt like oh they want to slag you could this that whatever but it was always like other women. I'm like, really? So that's an interesting part of it too, where it's kind of like um, women, you know, not necessarily supporting other women and then women slagging other women. For, mm. I, that's always perplexed me where it was kind of like, I think that is also part of it though, because this goes back to, I think, like when I first started, on the festival circuit mm -hmm. there were so few women at that time doing it did you get all the gigs that, that well there was it was a token female that was the big thing right. where it was like and then it was like there's another woman coming along and it was like all of a sudden it was a threat because well like legitimately i sometimes would message festivals and they would say we already have a woman we don't need <laughs> one to, that happened a lot it happened oh, a lot that's crazy. And so, I never thought about that. Yeah. And so then it was, uh, so it was like, what was interesting was because then it was like, so you realized that there was, there was a piece of the pie that was left open for you, but it was one piece. Mm. So it's like, how oh, we have a juggler, we have a unicyclist, we have an acrobat, we have a woman, we have a contortionist. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. And ironically, a lot of times you'd look at the lineup and they'd have three guys doing the exact same finale, but they wouldn't mm -hmm. think about it. Go, well, you have three guys doing a straight jacket, but God forbid you have two women. I right. mean, the world's going to freaking explode if that happens, you know, <laughs> but I think what was interesting, it was that it was like the opportunity um, was there was a piece of the pie mm -hmm. and it was like, we'll, we'll save a piece of the pie at the table for you, but you get one piece. Mm. So there was this feeling, I think of like, I did experience at the time, in some ways there was um, uh, a little bit from, from certain angles where it was like, no, I get this piece of pie and this is my piece of pie. And I'm not, I'm not ready to give up this piece of pie. Mm. So I'm gonna be really territorial about this piece of pie because I'm 
I've been the token here for a while. Right. Yeah. And, and I remember it, I was like, this is really fucked up. Um, and w- that's when I, uh, well, when I met Abby was um, when I first went to Melbourne and um, I want to give a huge shout out to Abby, actually, Abigail Collins, if anybody doesn't know her, because she, well, had she was re- actually interviewed very recently for the um, stories from the pitch by Magic Brian, I think. Her episode came out two months ago so oh awesome. yeah it's on it's on the same page as this will be if great you listen to abby's interview with magic brian so abby has been doing street performing longer than i have but she had a similar like she did her degree in theater arts and um she's a, a you know ballet it's a real strength in ballet she has i think she was like part of the national ballet in london and everything so she had this huge she had brought to the street all of that and then so her show that she created was the Cleopatra show. And, um, and then she had all the, the centurions. And, and I remember when I first saw that show, I was like, oh, this is really, really creative. This is yeah. really well done. This is really thought, this is a street theater yeah, piece. Totally. This, is, this is theater that she's created and put on the street. And I was it's, like- Yeah, it's designed and for then, the European market. Yeah, yeah. But then uh, we became friends. And then that's when her and Hotch were living in that uh, place in Brunswick. They had that factory. Remember, they had that warehouse. Yeah. And so I met Abby. We did a, a festival together. And she was not only was she brilliant, but she was so lovely. And she was just like, oh, Shazbat, come and stay with me, my husband. And so then <laughs> I, I went and I stayed with them and they were doing these variety shows then. And she was like, you're going to be in our variety show and we're going to do this. And, and I was like, oh, this is so great. Like, not only is she like brilliant, but she was so like lovely. And she genuinely like supported me and lifted me up. And I remember her saying to me, she was just like, cause I, she, there was getting a lot of flack at the time for the, the, you know, for using my sexuality or this or that, whatever. And Abby was like, don't you fucking let them. She's like, do not let them. And she's like, you just keep doing what you're doing. And I think you're awesome. And she would, you know, she'd like uh, advocate me to get certain gigs. And I was just like, I remember thinking to myself, I was like, this is where we want to be. This is actually, mm-hmm. instead of fighting over this one piece of pie, we should be advocating for each other and we should be f- not fighting with each other, but we should be fighting for the pie. Mm-hmm. We should be fighting that we should have half of that pie. At least maybe one day we can have, you know, maybe there'll be a festival where we got the whole pie, you know, like there was last so, year. Yeah. Yeah. So it was that thing of like going, oh, we've got it all wrong. We should not like, we're fighting over crumbs and yet we deserve to be at the dinner table having a full meal. This is bullshit. The big piece of chicken. I want a fucking <laughs> piece of steak. All right, assholes. <laughs> That's cool. And some tartar sauce, um, if I do say so. But that was really important because what I think struck in me from that friendship with Abby and mm. seeing that was kind of like, this, we can do this is the way I want I, this is the way it should be and then so what was interesting is that I really felt like um I took that lead from Abby mm-hmm. and I was kind of like okay I, I you know if we start encouraging more women instead of being threatened by women coming and yeah. doing this this is kind of like a breath of fresh air that the more women that I get the more I have on my the more we have the more that we can push with the our bigger, totally. our, the bigger our army is and the more that mm. we can push to get a, a seat at the table. And ultimately I do feel that, that not to say that I, but I think that evolved that way where then all of a sudden it was like people like Ben DM showed mm-hmm. up and, you know, Ellie and Kate and, you know, all these amazing women, there was like this surge of women that showed up. And then all of a sudden it was like, this is fucking awesome. <laughs> and then all of a sudden I'm, I'm sitting on a pitch and it's like, there's more women than men, or I'm at a festival and there's half of us there. And we're all just like, you know, three of us, all of a sudden we all start on the same, because it happens all of a sudden we're at a festival and everyone's on the same menstrual cycle. And it's kind <laughs> of like, you know, so then we can, you have a, a peer a camaraderie where it's sort of like, oh, it's okay, you got this. And, you know, here you need this to help out, you need that. And 
So instead of being in a place where you're like, fuck, I can't talk about this because I can't let on that I'm, I'm feeling vulnerable or weak about this and I need to do my three shows and I'm already being judged because I feel that uh, this, this and this. And, but you know, the fact that I'm feeling crummy and I've got my period and my tampon string was hanging out yesterday and all of this, <laughs> but now I've got these women that I can kind of, you know, they're just like fucking great. They're like, here, take some extra absorbency bitch and get yeah. on with it. I got three back here. So it changed that whole like it, it, it did kind of all of a sudden feel like um, the more women that are in it, the more that you're able to have representation in Absolutely. all areas of it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, obviously when you're a street performer, you get paid what you're worth. Do you think that there's uh, uh, any inequality in the way you get paid? That's a really good question. And it's funny because, I mean, I don't know because I don't, I don't talk a lot about what did you get? How much did you make? How much did you make? So, so I, tell I, us, tell us, tell us, yeah. tell us. <laughs> what's your, much what's your how big how much, so, how yeah. It's hilarious. I'm just <laughs> like, oh my God, I've, that is the funniest thing ever. I'm like, why don't fortunes, you guys- Fortunes, fortunes. Yeah. Just go and measure each other's dicks, okay? Like that, we'll just cut, we'll know. But I think what happens is that um, I think it's, I don't know that it's necessarily uh, a gender thing on the streets and I could be wrong. I think that it's a type of show that sometimes make um, a different demographic of money. And like, mm. cause I do feel that, um, and I have no complaints. I feel I'm, feel so fortunate that I'm able to not only make a living, but I've made a fairly decent living doing something that is ridiculous, really, when you think <laughs> about it. So I am not going to sit back and bitch about me not making this or that or whatever. I'm very aware of the fact that my show is character based um, more so than some other shows. And I've tried to make it a theatrical experience. Mm -hmm. And I do think that in certain street elements, there is a level that you're going to make financially and, and you just have to, I think the ceiling. That, that's the ceiling and that's just it. And, and for me, I accepted that because I was like, that is the, you know, whatever that, that this is what I want to do. And so I'm going to push it to that, that ceiling to as far as I could go. My ending in a sense is quite generic. I mean, it's ridiculous. I do a two high juggling fire torches. That's like the most <laughs> generic like stock thing you can do so in a sense i've tried to make this you know a, a experience that's my own and as creative as i can make it and, and and the characters are my own but then there's this thing on the end where you go okay as ridiculous as it is it's almost trying to optimize that character experience for a financial re reward mm -hmm. as big as that ceiling can go I remember seeing Leroy doing that spanner where he would do this incredible clown show. It was like, oh my God, it was beautiful. Yeah. And then he'd get on the unicycle and juggle torches. And, yeah. and people would always, some people would say, why do you do that? You don't need to do that. Mm -hmm. And he was like, yeah, but he's like, I'm doing the most creative thing I can do. And that just gives me, it brings my ceiling up to a certain bit where I can yeah. still walk away with it and feel like, and it's like, that's, it's just choices, right? So I remember I think, when I first saw um, Tony Living Space, he was doing a Tony Living Space show, but then at the end, he would do a too high and juggle machetes. <laughs> that's hilarious. Yeah, yeah. That's, so that's hilarious. It's the same thing. Yeah. So I think, um, I mean, I know that, uh, I know some of the women that I do know that they do really well with it. And I, I mean, I know, I mean, I've just seen, like people like Bendy M. I mean, she's just mm -hmm. incredible. And just her mind as a businesswoman, the way that she just at the end, she just, I was like, oh my God, you're a machine. I love you. Like I had so much respect for her because she had this show down. Oh, she had this show down to a science. And then at the end, she had like her little wristbands and she had, it was like, she had, it was like, yeah. she had all, and everything always looked perfect. And she had it all like set together. And I was just yeah. like, so I saw her, I saw Bendy do, like, she would kill it, you know, like for, so again, I don't know if, if the payback from money, if there's a, if there's an inequality in being paid because of your gender. Right. And I don't, I don't want to say there isn't. I'm just saying that I can't know. I, all I'm aware of is that there is 
definitely um, a difference in the type of show that you do. And, and But having said that, what is interesting is that I will show up at certain places and I know that there's other guys that would show up in some pitches and they would do a really, they had a, a really tight, well done generic show. And, and then, but for some reason, people just would not go for it. And mm. then I'd show up on some street pitches. I was just, I don't know why, but they, they just, they are really financially rewarding me here. Mm -hmm. So and, it's random. Mm -hmm. And do you feel um, mostly respected by your male colleagues? Yeah, I do now. Definitely. I think that I, I, but now, I that, also, now that you're in the Busker Hall of Fame, is that what now, you mean? Now that I've got my tiara, you know, absolutely out. <laughs> but I think, um, I, I do think that, um, like anything, if you're doing this long enough, I think there was, if people respect me, I think it's probably, they might not like my show. They might not necessarily even like me, but I think it's, they can't deny that I haven't worked my ass off. Mm. Yeah, and I think that's definitely put really, in the, the hard yards for sure. So I think there's, it's like I say, it's like, well, um, and I think that goes for everybody, you know, where it's like, we may not always like each other. We may not always get along. We might not always like each other's work, but when you see somebody who has undeniably worked their ass off there, you, it's, I think it's just a, that's inevitable that people will kind of go, you know, and that, I mean, I feel that way about other people. So mm -hmm. I would only imagine that maybe, um, yeah, we're never really going to know what it's like to be in somebody else's shoes. Who's you know? your favorite? Who's your favorite street performer to watch? I think Anthony Living Space. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> and, and like, he's just so, yeah, he's, I, I would watch him even like we did Dubai together. Yeah. And we were on the same, like a lot of the times I you've done Dubai. Was I, was I there that year? I think you were. Yeah. yeah I, think that's, you were. I think that's the last time I saw him do shows. Yeah. So it was, it was, and you know, the pitch that's way down at the other end of the Harbor and they would take you in a golf court right. and, and drive you down there. So Anthony and I had a lot of shows together at that end pitch. So we'd have to get in the golf cart together, drive down there. And he's just like, He's kind of, it sounds horrible, but he's like, he's like your pet. He's like, oh, I got my, my pet Anthony with me. He's just like a little toy, you know, <laughs> and he just, he does funny things and he's just super amusing. We did a lot of shows together there. And so I watched this show like for 10 days straight. I probably watched every single one of his shows because we were paired up together a lot. Mm -hmm. And I can honestly say I never got bored watching his show ever. No, you don't. There's always something, something's going to surprise you. He's always yeah. got something up his sleeve. Yeah. yeah. And it, he's like, it was, he, but he's that type of performer now where you kind of go, he just, he does kind of like, I know that you're saying he did the machetes back then, but now yeah. it's like, he does kind of refuse to compromise in the way uh -huh. that you're like, you're like the anti street performer, street performer. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Where you're yeah, like, yeah. Um, against the grain. Definitely. And I, I have this video of watching him in Edinburgh in 2019 and he was doing Hunter square and um, that's his, that's his pitch. It, yeah. And I remember I was sitting here and Dave and McSavage. I, yeah, Dave McSavage as well. But I remember just even in 2019 and I was watching Anthony and I turned around and looked and it was all the, not only all these street performers watching, but there was a crew of stand up comedians that were there. Um, and like Stu Goldsmith, who's gone on to do great things in stand up, mm -hmm. he was still just standing there, just in awe, just watching Living Space, just going. And um, also um, trying to think, like, I remember there were people that were like, oh, you got, like, I know stand up comedians that I really respect were like, oh, you got to watch this guy. He's fucking brilliant. This guy nice. really gets it. Like, and so that was really interesting, like going, that's where you could see that street performing had this like cross pollination into where mm. people would go, oh, that, because I think street performing years ago was just about the fact that there was a bunch of actors or people or whatever, and they didn't have 
the money to be able to play or pay for a rehearsal space or to mm-hmm. be able to book a theater or whatever. So they're like, well, let's just, we've got this space yeah. that nobody owns and we can go out and experiment and play. And, mm. and when you watch Anthony, I think you, it's almost like you're, I mean, this, I don't I'm trying not to sound too like, you know, ridiculous, but you do have these moments of when you watch Anthony, where you feel like you're being transformed to like a different era because Definitely. you're like he he's really tapping into like this magical um era of what like you know that play was probably like all the time mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The, the the 70s and the 80s Covent Garden yeah 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 absolutely and um so what do you think is uh what do you think is next for Sharon um are we gonna see Tallulah out there soon well, when we finish this, I'm going to go to the toilet. That's going to be next. All right. Well, before um, you go. Then uh, before that, yeah. Um, well, I'm going to keep, I think the stand up, you know, I really feel like, um, I, I do feel always really fortunate to be able to have street performing. And it's, it's in a way, it's, I feel like it's a large part of my roots. Um, and like, it's interesting because like Eddie Izzard, even though he went on, and he's you know taken stand up to the top of the pyramid with stand up mm-hmm. when he did the o2 center i remember him being interviewed on late night and he said um well the only reason why i understood how to work the o2 center as a comedian because a lot of comedians would be like, like that'd be my worst nightmare yeah it's so large it's such a you know it's just a and, big street show yeah and he said it was because as a street performer and working in Covent Garden and working these big open outdoor spaces, he's like, that's the only reason I got how to be able to work that space as a comedian. So I feel, I feel really honored and like, still like, I I love the fact that a lot of my legs are from street performing. Mm. I I do think that at one point, like stand up, I'm because I'm really pursuing stand-up as much as I can and I my dream my goals of stand-up is like I do want to take it to you know there are different you know sets of goals of what I want to achieve and accomplish with that and and I'm trying to use the same tenacity that I've used with street performing Mm -hmm. in stand-up so I'm never going to give up like I'm I'll be I'll pull a Joan Rivers I'll be 80 still plugging away at it so the good thing about it is is that once you learn how to get good at something, you can learn how to get good at something else. You know the path, you, you see the way, you know? Yeah. And uh, it's funny you talk about Eddie cause, because he actually was in Boston a few years ago, saw me do a show, came up afterwards and uh, spoke to me and, uh, and invited me to his show and we went. And after the show, he said, uh, you know, I forget what we were talking about, but he said, you, you gotta take it inside because when you're outside, no matter how big you are, no matter how f- famous you might get, people don't want to know, won't they'll forget your name. When you go inside, that's when they, they know your name. Yeah. It's yeah. a weird thing, isn't it? And I don't know, like, I don't fully understand why, but it's, it's interesting that there is still, in s- ignorant people don't get street performing sometimes. And mm-hmm. I still even have, like, in the stand-up world um and less now but i know that uh you know 15 years ago there was a lot of comedians that would judge and you know byron does stand up and street as well there was a lot of stand-up comedians that would look down on on us yeah and i was like whatever i'm like (laughs) you know you you guys are are working a nine-to-five job that you hate you know, slugging coffee or whatever. And there's right. absolutely nothing wrong with that. And there's a lot of honor in doing that, but that's not what you want to be doing. Mm. And yet you're looking down on us because we're doing something we love. We have the, that's, we have the freedom of being able to pick and choose when we want to work and we do really well at it and we have an amazing lifestyle. So you judge all you want, <laughs> but it's, it's, it's an ignorance, I think. And the people yeah. who get it, who know it, understand it. Like, I find it really interesting, some of the established comedians that I come across that get it and are like, like, I even remember, you know, like being in Los Angeles and there were certain people that I never thought that would just be like, oh my God, you are a street performer? Holy fuck, that is really 
that's really awesome. That's mm -hmm. really, they're like, that's hardcore. That is really, but I think that maybe also in Los Angeles, there's more an awareness of like where like Robert Williams did street performing and, mm -hmm. you know, even Steve Martin did some. And so they, a lot, maybe more in that world, they have an idea of like where a lot of comedians came from. Mm -hmm. And, and so they have a bit more respect for it where I think that there's some people who just, they're just, like I say, they're just ignorant. They don't they get never it. Seen but, it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I've had to learn the hard way of sometimes just going, who cares? Yeah. You know, like, uh, it, that's their loss ultimately, mm -hmm. because you think of all the people that you, you know, when you think of like living space and Fraser and Abby and, and yourself and all these people that you just go, I mean, imagine going to a festival and seeing all these, you know, amazing performers and you go, Oh my God, this is like, so anybody who doesn't get it has obviously just never been exposed to yeah. the magic of it. But I think ultimately um, I want to keep, pursuing stand-up uh like as much as I can um and I, I, I what I like about the stand-up is that I can use all the skills that I have from street performing mm -hmm. there's just certain um with stand-up there's just things that the the subtleties and the voices of, of of like being able to use my voice to say certain things that um you can explore in that room that as street performing is in one way is like there's all these other uh, opportunities and things that can happen from it but there is also there's limits there's on, rules yeah mm -hmm. where in stand-up it's just a, a different genre yeah. um so i don't know i think that probably i'll end up just pushing harder and harder with stand-up hopefully Awesome. You know, but I'll never lose my roots and my love for street performing. Well, and I do think that I'll be 80 and I'll still go out and do a Tallulah show. Nice. Well, I'll be seeing the uh, Miss Tallulah out in uh, Burlington in a couple of months. So that'll be fun. That'll be awesome, Al. Yeah. Well, this has been great. Thanks for, uh, you know, doing a nice interview and um, congratulations on being in the Busker Hall of Fame for 2021. Thunder Cunt Hall of Fame. <laughs> <sighs> <laughs> oh, one quick thing too. What I really want to do is start a homeless hall of fame. Nice. Because this little is bike boys friends in there. Well, yeah, I think there's so many awesome homeless people that are part of our shows. And some of them are the most amazing characters. Craig like Lewis. And, yeah, Lu totally. Oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> from Edinburgh. And you just think like these characters are part of our um, world and they're part of the Pepe you know, could the, be in both oh my <laughs> <laughs> that's great he really could yeah. um but I I that's another thing that I think would be really cool I was thinking about like starting a homeless hall of fame because it, it also you it, and not in a way where it's derogatory but like honoring these people that you go yeah. essentially we're going into their world we're entering their living room and it's like so I always found that aspect of it really interesting. And uh, mm. so my, uh, what I want to do after this is also start a homeless hall of fame and get awesome. people to sort of talk about some of the homeless people that are part of their pitch and part of their world and talk nice. about them. And, um, yeah. Honor that's them a, a bit. That's a great idea. I like it. I'm on board. Well, uh, there we go. Let's, uh, let's call it a day right there. Sounds awesome. Lots of love, Al. Lots of love. See you later. Bye. Head over to the Busker Hall of Fame website where you'll find a link in the episode notes and the video version of this interview that you could watch on our YouTube channel. As always, if you'd like to support the podcast and show off the cool new logo, check out our online store where you'll find t-shirts, mugs, stickers, and more. Speaking of supporting the podcast, you can also visit the Busker Hall of Fame website and throw a little love into our online hat by clicking on the donate button. Or become a sustaining supporter of this project at patreon.com forward slash busker stories. Thanks in advance for supporting this project and helping keep busking history alive. Music for this podcast came from 357 Lover. You can subscribe in Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Google Play, and Spotify, and follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. If you enjoyed this podcast, please tell a friend about it and leave us a five-star review. It'll help get us noticed, and we'd really appreciate it. If you'd like someone to be interviewed or you feel a certain voice has not been heard, 
please reach out to me and let me know. We're doing our best to capture interviews and stories with as many performers as we possibly can. It's up to you to help fill in the gaps. On behalf of myself, Al Miller for capturing the interview and doing the preliminary edit, and the rest of the team of the Busker Hall of Fame, remember, if you can't laugh at yourself, find someone else and laugh at them. I'm Magic Brian. Thanks for listening. <laughs>